Good morning, friends, and welcome to our service of worship here at First United Methodist Church in Morristown on this first Sunday in the month of July, as we are now firmly into our summer season. It is uh, the day after Independence Day, the 4th of July, and I hope you all had a wonderful day yesterday. I think a lot of towns celebrated on Friday, and with things uh, opening up a, a little bit more around us, uh, I'm sure that uh, enabled you to do some fun things, hopefully with uh, maybe some family and friends while still remaining uh, safe as we continue through this uh, time of COVID-19. Just a word about uh, the church reopening. There's been, of course, a lot of discussion about that as I sent out an email about a week and a half ago uh, talking about the reopening team that uh, First UMC has formed. We are uh, purposely being cautious about the reopening. We have not yet set an exact date for that as we continue to put into place what needs to be put into place in order for that reopening to, uh, to occur. And many things do have to be in place before that happens, including a reopening plan that has been approved by our church council. So we are in the midst of, uh, of doing that, and uh, hopefully uh, we will be able to gather together uh, soon indoors in our sanctuary, um, as I say, uh, soon down the road. In the meantime, we have some outdoor services for the summer planned. And uh, as I described in that email, uh, we have some dates set for that. So that will be coming up in July and in August. So check for that email for those dates as well. Let's uh, begin our worship service now. We give thanks to God for this day. We give thanks for the freedoms that we enjoy in our country, uh, especially during this time of pandemic. So let's begin our worship. Let's join our hearts together. Oh God. 
Let's join together in prayer. God of all creation, God of all grace, God who is with us through the heights and through the depths as we journey through this life, we have gathered on this day of Sabbath, O oh God. We gather to rest, we gather to praise your holy name and to breathe in your spirit as we open our hearts in worship to you this morning. God, as we gather, we look for your word of hope and promise through the scripture that we hear, through the music that we hear, the prayers that we experience today. We ask, God, that you would bring wholeness to those places in our lives that are broken, that you would comfort those places that are wounded and forgive our waywardness, O oh God, as a people. Focus our minds and our hearts on your love for us and the world that you have called us to serve. Use us, God, in a way that reflects your will for us, your will for our lives. Even though, yes, we are imperfect vessels, enable us to be what you have created us to be so that we may serve as your people in the world. And today, God, we, we give thanks to you, especially for the gift of freedom that we just celebrated uh, these past couple days, especially yesterday on Independence Day, because we are truly blessed, God, that you have called us to be a, a nation as a beacon of hope for a world where there is so much hopelessness. May we remember that call as a nation that, that is blessed in this role. And God, we are grateful for the sacrifices of so many who have earned for us this freedom that we enjoy. We, we think about struggles, struggles that are past and, and present, struggles that have denied us and, and have defined us. And we continue to thank you that you walk with us as a nation. Hear us as we pause now to pray for people and for situations, God, where your grace and your mercy and your healing are so desperately needed, needed to be lifted up, especially in a world like ours, oh God, as we continue through this time of, of pandemic with some uncertainties about the future and what it might bring. We put our trust and our faith in you. And so, God, we, we pray for a world where violence, a world where war seems to be uh, the first choice sometimes rather than the very, very last resort. We pray for peace in our world. We pray for minds to come together, for hearts to come together as, as one. And that all nations and races and denominations and religions and and all people can come to a place of mutual respect for one another where war is no more. We pray, God, for our world where uh, our technology, as wonderful as that can be as at times, God, a wonderful gift, a gift for good, but too often that t technology can be used in ways that are, are destructive and, and damaging. So we pray for uh, responsible use of science, responsible use of all the wonderful ways that that, that medical doctors are, are blessed, that scientists are, are blessed to do what they do through the gifts you've provided them. We pray for a world, O oh God, where nations can easily uh, feed the hungry and, and can easily house the homeless and, and provide for the least and the lowest in society, and, and yet they elect not to. We pray that you would place it upon our hearts as followers of Jesus, that one of our responsibilities is to look after our sister and our brother in need, that we need to love one another as we love you. And that's not just in word, O oh God, but in deed. God, in, in this world that we pray for, we, we pray for a softening of hearts, attitudes of compassion, uh, an interfaith spirit, a spirit of cooperation, That someday, O oh God, that vision that Jesus has given us, the kingdom of justice and righteousness and hope, that kingdom may come to pass in all this fullness. And so for all this, all this, and so many things that we bring to worship this morning that remain on our hearts, we pray these things in the strong and the healing name of Jesus. Jesus, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Bye. 
Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from the gospel according to Matthew in the 10th chapter, verses 24 to 31. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, and even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. We pray this reading from scripture this morning would find a a welcome place in our hearts as we think more about Jesus' words here in Matthew's gospel. The bird feeder that you're looking at in the background is the same bird feeder that my mom used to love to watch birds eating at, especially during the final uh, several months of her life. She would look at these birds in the morning and just brought her great joy just to watch them land on this feeder and, and, and eat. And that reminded me that ever since I started living in parsonages as a pastor, I've always had something of a zoo in the backyard. And that was particularly the case with, we got our dog Ike about uh, coming up on 12 years ago now, and he would just bark at anything and anyone who, who would pass by. He still does that. He's still a bit of a nut, but he's a good dog. And I always put up bird feeders too in, in the houses that I've lived in. And the bird feeders would attract all sorts of species. And I'm not just talking about birds, right? Because they're the inevitable squirrels, and squirrels can drive some people crazy. People who enjoy watching birds, squirrels usually drive them nuts, and uh, no pun intended there. And they would go through elaborate, elaborate uh, systems and, and techniques to try to keep squirrels off of the feeders, and the squirrels usually win that battle. But, you know, I don't never minded too much when squirrels would use the feeders. I guess I would channel my mom with that, too, and she would say something like, well, you know, the squirrels have to eat, too, so why not just feed them? And, of course, at the feeders, everyone just seemed to get along just uh, just fine. Then, of course, there were the chipmunks as well. And the way I looked at it, chipmunks would provide a valuable service by cleaning up what the birds and the squirrels would spill out of the feeder, feeders. You see, I never realized that birds were such incredible slobs. Did you know that? Look at this guy on the feeder right now. They would just pick at the seed and maybe get the seed that they wanted, especially particular varieties of birds, and they would spill out a whole bunch of seed on the ground. Well, the chipmunks would clean it up. And then, of course, from the non-avian list as well, occasionally we'd have a groundhog or two who would come by, and usually those groundhogs live somewhere nearby, and they'd, they'd come by and they would clean up as well. Um, there's a groundhog that lives out back here as well, who I sometimes uh, see at night coming by and cleaning up uh, after the birds are done for the day. Then, of course, there's the birds themselves. And I've always lived kind of in wooded areas, so I get so many different varieties of birds coming to my feeders. Now, there are birds that I've just never seen before, too, in some places. And one in particular that uh, sometimes I do see here as well kind of has a longish beak and a bright orange crown on the top of its head. It's just a beautiful bird, and I suspect it's like a woodpecker or something like that, but I'm not very good at this. So if you know what kind of bird that is and I'm describing, or you see it landing on this feeder, could you, could you let me know? Because I'm really interested. <laughs> But what I've also noticed is that there's a definite pecking order among the birds. And again, no pun intended. And the pecking order has to do with who gets to use the feeders first. And tops on that list is usually the crows, the black crows. They're kind of the muscle of the group. They're really big birds. And when they want to eat, everyone kind of, you know, gets out of the way for them. But then comes the mid-sized birds. And I usually see blue jays coming by. They're, they're kind of big too, but not as big as the crows. And of course, the occasional cardinal. And they're kind of, uh, you know, you can't mistake a cardinal, especially a male cardinal is so, so beautifully red. So I see them as well. But then at the bottom of the pecking order 
are what I think are sparrows of some sort. Now, I don't know if they're really sparrows or not, but that's what I'm going to call them for the purposes of today's message, because if they're not sparrows, it'll ruin my message. So, hey, bird people, if you see a sparrow land up here on the feeder, just let me know that as well, so I know what I'm talking about. Now, these quote-unquote sparrows always seem to be kind of waiting off to the side until the other birds are done. It's kind of like they're the, the second-class citizens in the bird world who wind up getting all the leftovers. And, and they're kind of the plainest-looking birds of, of all, too. And they're easy to overlook. If there weren't so many of them, there's always tons of them around. I remember reading a little bit about sparrows, and, and they've always kind of had this reputation throughout history. One author said this, I'll read this for you, sparrows are about as worthless as you can get in the bird world. Kind of harsh, right? They're, they're dirty, they usually have fleas, and they reproduce abundantly. They don't sing, so they have no song. They're, they're not very colorful, if, if at all colorful. And they're just not that pretty. Yeah, kind of harsh. Another author said this, Sparrows are some of the most plentiful common birds in the world. Where you find people, you'll find sparrows. They only live in populated areas because they're the scavengers of leftovers. So sparrows have a reputation, don't they? They have a reputation for being somewhat insignificant in the bird world. And yet, and yet, Jesus chose the sparrow to illustrate something very important about God. And so in today's scripture reading from, from Matthew's gospel, Jesus is kind of speaking in code to those of his disciples who are, are, are being maligned and, and being persecuted for being one of his followers. And, and what Jesus is basically telling them is that they're guilty by association. But because of their relationship to Jesus, people are, are treating them badly. But he also tells them not to worry about that. Not to worry about what other people say and what other people do because they are beloved children of God. First and foremost, their identity is as beloved children of God. And what they've been called to be as disciples, well, it involves a much bigger picture that, well, sometimes the rest of the world can't possibly understand. And then Jesus says this, beginning in verse 29. He says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet one of them will fall to the ground, unperceived, by your father. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Now, now, do you hear what Jesus is saying? He's saying that even a creature who the rest of the world considers to be almost worthless and dirty and flea-ridden and ugly, even a second-class citizen like the sparrow, doesn't escape the watchful, caring gaze of its creator. And he says, aren't you... You disciples, you wonderfully created works of art, crafted for great things by, by your creator, aren't you of infinite more worth than a sparrow? You see, this is Jesus at his most brilliant. This is, this is Jesus knowing how to, how to build people up and remind them of, of just who they are. This is a theme that we've been kind of looking at for the past couple of weeks in, in messages and and. and recognizing how important you are in God's eyes. Especially, especially when everything and everyone around you just wants to tear you down. This is Jesus saying, you are so worth it. You are so worth it. God believes in you and, and what you're capable of doing in this world. And yes, there's going to be times when you're feeling, feeling badly, you're feeling down about yourself, or when things aren't going the way you had hoped, and, and when you're feeling that you've been wronged or you're, you're being put down. But don't let it get to you, Jesus says, because there is a bigger picture out there. A bigger picture that some people just aren't going to understand. And here's the thing. You're a part of that big picture. So one of my all-time favorite silly movies, I'll call it, is the movie Airplane. Maybe you like Airplane as well. It's just a silly, fun movie. But And there are so many great lines from Airplane that, gosh, we could quote for the rest of the message this morning. But the one that fits in best with what we're talking about comes from the main character whose name is Ted Stryker. And Ted Stryker is sitting on a plane just before it's getting ready to take off. And an elderly woman comes down the aisle and sits next to him and notices, gosh, how worried he looks. So the woman says to him, 
nervous? And Stryker says back to her, yes. And so thinking that this might be his, his first flight ever, the woman says, first time? And Stryker says, no, I've been nervous lots of times. It's that kind of movie if you haven't seen it. You know, everybody gets nervous once in a while. It's perfectly natural. You know, when church is just about ready to start every Sunday morning, I'll confess to you, I, I still get some butterflies. I think I'd be worried if I didn't get butterflies. But you know, when nervousness turns into worry and worry turns into anxiety, it's usually a symptom of something else going on. It's usually a sign of fear, isn't it? Fear of the unknown. Fear of what might happen. Fear of, of all the what ifs that start going through your head. Fear of what other people might think. Knowing that fear is often the main stumbling block to what? I've said it many times in messages, especially recently. Fear is the main stumbling block to faith. Jesus wants to calm our nerves and ease our worries and, and lessen our anxieties. And so Jesus knows that fear is the main stumbling block to faith. He wants to free us from the chains of fear. He wants us to know that we have a creator God who, who isn't far removed from those times when we're, we're feeling down about ourselves or when things aren't going the way we had hoped and, or when we feel that we're, we're being wrong or being put down. We have a God who is as close to us, as I've also said on occasion, as close to us as our breathing. A God who knows even the numbers of hairs on our heads. A God who cares even for a lowly bird like the sparrow. There is a uh, great story about a famous baseball player. I loved baseball growing up. I still love it. I miss it right now. But this famous baseball player, and I'm sure many of you have heard of him. He's, uh, his nickname was the Old Professor, I used to call him. And he was Casey Stengel. Now, Casey Stengel is probably best known for his uh, successful years with the powerhouse Yankees. And he's also known as well for his, well, less than successful years with the expansion New York Mets in the early 1960s. But what a lot of people don't know is that Stengel was a really good outfielder. He was pretty good at it with, with the Brooklyn Dodgers when he was much younger. And he was a fan favorite at Ebbets Field until he was traded one year to, to Pittsburgh. And so on his first trip back to Brooklyn after he was traded to Pittsburgh, the fans, if you know the fans in Brooklyn, this doesn't surprise you, they booed him mercilessly. They booed their beloved Casey Stengel. But he wasn't going to let that get to him, you see. Instead, he was going to win them over, even though he was now playing for, for the Pittsburgh Pirates. And so warming up in the outfield, he, he spotted a sparrow that was caught in the fencing, apparently, according to this story. And he kind of gently freed the bird and, and held it in his hands, and he tucked it under his cap without anyone really noticing. The inning hadn't started yet. It was just warming up. And so then in the top of the inning, he came up to bat, and the fans really started into him. You know, they started, started booing him and just getting on him, you know. And that's when Casey Stengel took a step back kind of flamboyantly from home plate and he gave an exaggerated bow to the crowd and he removed his cap and the sparrow flew away. Well, I mean, the crowd went crazy and after that, I mean, Casey Stengel was a fan favorite once again in, in good old Brooklyn. You see, it takes a secure person of confidence and, and a person knows exactly who they are to be able to pull off something like that. Now, as people of faith, we might, might say that such confidence and knowledge of who we are comes from our relationship with God, right? It's an awareness that our God of unconditional love is, is on our side, as Martin Luther once said. It's knowing that the same God who created everything also desires that, that we should live in joy and we should live in, in peace, and that when it doesn't work out that way, God will walk us through the storm, as we talked about last week. You see, it comes down to believing, doesn't it? When you make room for belief in your life, suddenly the doors of a possibility are thrown open to you. 
and no longer you're just kind of making your way through to a world of chance with with nobody having your back now now there is someone who is paying attention someone who cares someone whose eye is even on the sparrows maybe in our world where everything kind of needs to be explained all the time what we need is a a healthy dose of, of belief taking the risk of faith as they say so maybe our prayer this morning should be the one prayed by by the father in in mark's gospel in the ninth chapter when he asked jesus to heal his son jesus says to the man that that all things can be done for those who believe and the man replies from the very depth of his being i believe help my unbelief Are you in the midst of a, a crisis of confidence right now, not really knowing anymore exactly perhaps who you are in this world? It's easy in a world like this, right? Your nerves get frayed. Your worries start to get to you. They can even make you physically sick. You get riddled with anxiety. Does it seem like everything and everyone around you just wants to tear you down sometimes? I tell you, this pandemic can cause a lot of that. And the isolation can cause a lot of that. In the wake of all the racial tension that we're going through in our, our nation, there can be an awful lot of that. So if that's the case with you, if you're feeling this, this crisis of confidence, if your nerves are frayed, if your worries are making you sick, if you're riddled with, with anxiety, or even you know if you're just feeling a little down, which we all do on occasion, and things aren't going the way that you hoped or you're feeling wronged about something, just remember Jesus' words to us today. And I'll paraphrase. You're so worth it. You are so worth it. God believes in you and what you're capable of doing in this world. Don't be afraid of anything in this life because there is a bigger picture out there. And you are a part of it. For not even sparrows escape the watchful, caring gaze of their creator. And aren't you, you, a wonderfully created work of art, crafted by, by your creator for great things, aren't you of more infinite worth than a sparrow? Amen.
Friends, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. May you know these words in your heart this day. And may you know that no matter what life might bring, no matter the challenges, no matter the anxiety, no matter the fears, God walks with you and you are not on this journey alone. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you on this day and remain with you always. Amen.